Good morning, day 30. And what we're going to talk about is all sorts of quite exciting things you can do with binocular vision. So this is really very much post seven, eight. And it's as much as anything to get teachers and parents playing with their eyes to understand why binocular vision is so important and how to sustain it, maintain it, get it. So let us play. So first thing that's really useful is to understand your own binocular vision. And there is a thing called a Brock string and you can make your own true Blue Peter style, for those of you who are British, you need a piece of string and three beads. You can also buy one online for about eight, 10 pounds, which strikes me as quite expensive for a piece of string and three beads. And you're going to place it really at the center point between your two eyes, right under your nose. You can feel where it is and you're going to look down it really sharply with both eyes, nice big eyes. When you look down with two eyes, what your eyes should see if they focus on the first bead is the two strings making an X. If you're not seeing two strings, then possibly one eye is not doing very much. And it's, you might want to go and see a behavioral optometrist. But let's assume you can focus in on that first bead, both eyes are working and you see an optical illusion of two strings. If you move your focus to the red bead, you then see one red bead, two blue, two green. Whatever you're focusing in on is going to be in single and what you're not focusing in on should double. And that's telling you both eyes are sending messages to the brain. When you do eye exercises, it's really useful biofeedback because as you strengthen your eye muscles, and you get things working better and better, particularly your converge and diverge, so you can really focus in on your pencil top, in and out, you should see the effect on how sharply your eyes can focus. So the more ex you exercise your eyes, the better you should be able to control your Brock string. And it's really useful biofeedback. The big problem when you're working with children is they want to please you. So you say to them, what can you see? And they're incredibly good at telling you what you want to hear rather than what they can see. So really watch them like a hawk because you may not actually really be able to gauge from this what they can actually see, but it's very useful. And as children mature and they become more reliable, it's a tool they can use. Then they've got more control over how their two eyes work together. And eventually, particularly with older teens, they need to have that level of understanding and control. You can go further and be more testing and you can work with something called eccentric circles. And what you're doing with these is you put a pencil in between when well, you're standing at about arms width away, arms length away from them. You're going to put a pencil in between the two circles. You're going to bring the pencil towards your eyes. And as you bring your, the pencil and you're focusing ferociously on the pencil top, you should get an optical illusion of a third set of circles. If you can't do the Brock string, you certainly won't be able to do this. That third set of circles, what will happen is the little circle in the middle is central, ideally, and ideally it's coming out towards you. And ideally it's really sharp. When it judders in and out, that's telling you eyes are not strong enough. They're not getting sharp enough focus. And you need to be able to get to the point where you can really sharply focus. Otherwise, you've just not got really well exercised eyes. And you ought to be able to get and hold those circles. So you've got this very sharp image, which is an optical illusion. And you are going to be able to dip your head down, dip your head up. You still keep it. Turn your head to one side, turn your head to the other side. And always you can keep the image quite sharply of that third circle. And that is telling you your eyes are working equally to send equal messages to the brain. When it judders in and out, they're just not sharp enough. And that gives you, I hope, an understanding of just how strong and sharp we need focus to work in order to be a really efficient learner. It's something you can go away and play on. 
pomp. Your hunter-gatherer always hunts with two eyes. You need two eyes to sharply focus. You need two eyes to send messages to the brain. With two eyes, you go so much more accurately and quickly. When you go down to one eye, that's fine if you've got 100 bullets. You want to be accurate, spot on first time. You've got two, two eyes working. The Victorians were great lovers of stereoscopes pre-television. And what you can do with this exactly the same as with the eccentric circles, Google Victorian stereoscopic images and there'll be loads of them. And this is one of my favourites, it's going off to Egypt. And if you focus in on your pencil and you bring it towards your nose, and I can see from this image that what I've got is a third image in the middle. And that third image in the middle, I see much more sharply than the two mono pictures. I see the detail much more sharply. That should be telling you that when our two eyes work together, we see a lot more information. Our brain is able to interrogate the picture in 3D. We're picking up a lot more knowledge from this and information. We're able to analyze it differently. In World War II, we used stereo cameras extensively for gathering information. And women would sit there, largely women, analyzing the photographs later because the stereo images gave so much more information. And in case you want to see what a stereo camera does, you've got the two cameras working together about five degrees apart. You're getting the same image, but from the position your eyes would be apart. And hence it works to produce this effect. It's fun. And of course, it's more fun looking at stereo images to exercise your eyes than just circles. You can go and have a look at stereo animation. And so there's a nice um, video you can watch, which I have put links to. And you can see this image, first of all in stereo, and then when it's moving, you can follow it and you you can see your brain is seeing a tremendous amount more depth than if you were seeing a mono. It's a much more exciting experience. If you cannot work with binocular vision, none of this is possible. You're losing a huge amount of what you could possibly see. It's really important. 3D links into intelligence. So if we take a simple cube drawing, so I've drawn three cubes, and what I've done is I've coloured in one face on the first one, so it looks like a box and they're looking down. On the second one, I've coloured in a different cube, different square, and of course it now looks like a box we're looking up to. It's just an illusion how you see the box. With the third box, I haven't coloured anything in. Your brain can see it one way or the other way. The faster you can change from one image to another using your binocular vision, and your brain is using stereo vision to change its sense of image, the faster you can do that, you tend to score higher scores on IQ tests. Because if you think about IQ tests, you're seeing pattern faster. It is, that is all you're doing. Your saccadic nerves, the nerves in your brain are working faster and faster. You can flick from one image to the other, one image to the other. So it's worth practicing. And you can do the same with optical illusions. So do you see a rabbit? Do you see a duck? How fast can you move from rabbit to duck, duck to rabbit, rabbit to duck, duck to rabbit? And you're making your brain see one thing, see the other, see one thing, see the other getting that eye to brain working fast. Exactly the same thing with other optical illusions and with things like tunnels. Can I see a tunnel? Do I see a cone? Tunnel, cone, tunnel, cone. How fast can I move from tunnel to cone? And the faster I can do that, the faster I can use my binocular vision to send equal messages to my brain, the faster I can interrogate complex visual information. It's important. It really affects intelligence. It really affects how we see pattern, how we see shape, how we understand the world. 
and how we understand complex problems. There's a very good website, which I think you ought to go to, called iCanLearn.com, and that has got a whole series of activities you can do linked to how binocular vision works and to exercise children's eyes to get to good control of their binocular vision. It starts flagging a bit towards the end of the website, but it is a very good website. So what I've done is I've gone through explaining all the different sections in it and then putting a few other exercises in. So they talk about tracking, i.e. how your eyes move along text, visual perception, your ability to analyze space, shape, and so on. Eye teaming, how well your two eyes work together to stop and seeing double, which is pretty much what we've just done. Your ability to focus and focus far. Your ability to work with your vision and your motor skills. So bringing those areas together because binocular vision is complicated and we need to develop all areas of it. So eye tracking, you can have some pretty simple things. So for instance, just a great big sheet of paper with lines and numbers, and the child is simply going one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five. And what they're doing is they're exercising their eyes. They're getting their eyes, the head isn't moving, it's just their eyes. The eyes are getting stronger and stronger at moving quickly across text. And you do quite a lot of that, your reading speeds go up. I personally find it's much easier getting them doing the old ball throwing business because I found that the tracking gets better as well with getting children to be able to juggle. It increases their reading speed and doing both is good. You're just getting them used to moving the eyes one side to the other. All good stuff builds reading speed. But remember, this isn't the only thing you need to be an efficient reader. You've got to be able to hear, track your eyes, got to be able to decode it, all the rest. Visual perception is being able to make sense of things. So for instance, nice game called Shapeometry, absolutely adore. It's pretty much unavailable in Britain, but it is incredibly good. You get cards that say, look, Given these two green shapes and these two blue shapes, can you make from them the same shape? And you've got to look at them and think, how do I manipulate those shapes in order to make the same shape? To begin with, yes, let the child play around, experiment. Let the child put shapes on top of each other till they can understand that shape. Eventually you want to get to state where they can do it without touching it. They understand what they can, they can see it in their mind's eye. They can move the pieces. It has to be that the eyes are doing it, not touch. And if you rely on touch, I know that card six, you will fall apart. Can't keep going any longer. Illusion, another game, daft game. What you're trying to do is take the cards and put them into order of whatever the color is that's chosen on the dominant arrow card, so this is yellow, which card has got most yellow in it, which card has got least yellow, and you rank the cards. And you only play normally with a few cards because it's actually a really hard game. But it really makes you think about your perception of how much colour there is in each card. And just the enormous array of ways in which we can see and perceive shape, form, pattern. We need to work with it. We need to have a very wide range of games. Sure, children should be doing them every day, making and creating pattern, making and creating shape. This is how you develop a sense of spatial awareness, how you develop a sense of spatial maths, how you develop a sense of pattern how you develop a sense of symmetry, how you develop a sense of reflection. You need to get to the point where you can do them from memory, where you can do them and make extend patterns. You can do them and you can make a mirror image of the pattern you've made. Every which way I could write a book on, wasting your years from seven to 10 making patterns. Eye teaming is, as we said, it's getting the two eyes to work together, to be able to converge, diverge, not to see double. 
really important because if you're seeing double, it's going to interrupt absolutely everything else. And remember, there may well be problems with seeing double if you haven't got retained primitive reflexes. There may be problems with seeing double because just the basic muscles around your eyes are weak. So you need to strengthen them. You need to do basic eye exercises. You can do games where you are reading near and you're reading far. So you're reading and you're not reading the words, you're going F-R-I-E-N-D-S, I-C-O-M-E, R-O-M-A-N-S. And you're literally, re you're just focusing on a few of the letters, reading them near, reading them far. And you have one on the wall, one you're holding in your hand. You are practicing changing your focus. And that is a really good thing to do for life because it stops your focusing skills weakening, particularly if you're spending all day on computers. Just practicing things like basketball, getting your hand to eye working, getting to be able to judge distance. It's a skill you practice, you learn. So lots of different sports activities that get the vision working, that get the vision working across the midline. Things like learning to sail, I like them because you've got to work with your whole body. You've got to be visually planning. You've got to be looking where you're doing things quite precise. And if you don't do it, there are definite consequences. You get cold and wet or you crash. And it's it takes a long time to master, but it's complex motor sensory. And you are really having to use your whole body and your visual system to plan where you're going to go. And certainly near us, there are some very good sailing schools in safe environments that are very well run and not horrendously expensive that will lend people the equipment. Climbing, even just going out to your local woods and going up rough terrain, there are consequences. If you don't know where your feet and hands are, you fall over. You get up, you try again, but this time you have a bit of a think. And I tell people how to place their feet, to go sideways down hills, how to, how to control things so they can climb and eventually they get the skills. Using tools, making things, hammers, nails, they also have quite pleasant consequences. People learn because they want to do it and it's frustrating if they can't. And compasses and so on. The more we use our hands, our eyes, our brain, the more it comes together. We have to maintain vision through life. Our children are growing. They go on growing till 25. A lot is changing. And so proactively doing visual exercises, doing visual challenges, doing things that require seeing complex patterns, understanding how to break it down. It's all really, really important. So as the brain changes, as the body grows, the brain, eyes, body all have to keep re-knitting. They have to keep readjusting. You know with big adolescents when they make a big growth spurt, there's that patch when they're blundering everywhere. They don't know where their body is. We have to maintain it for life. We have to make sure it works with all senses. We need it there to fend off old age. So please, all of these are for everyone, use them or lose them. Here are my contact details, my last quick burst, and I hope you've enjoyed the 30 days of videos. I hope you find them useful and I shall think of something else to do for the next 30 days. Enjoy the rest of lockdown. Goodbye, keep in touch.